seriously injured while trying to stop an illegal rave party in the Forest of Dean. Officers were pelted with bricks and rubble by some of the 400 partygoers at a disused colliery building near Cinderford. Police and council officials have been meeting today to discuss ways of stopping the illegal parties. Francis Donovan reports. The Gloucester rave party lasted 15 hours, attracting hundreds of youngsters from all over the country. The organisers say the parties are innocent affairs, offering harmless fun for youngsters and a chance to let off steam. Critics say this new phenomenon of the 90s is carefully planned to break the law and make money, introducing drugs like ecstasy to impressionable youngsters. Eventually, police moved in in force to break the party up. Seven people, including the organisers, were arrested. Three officers were injured in scuffles with the party goers, who were angry that their enjoyment had been brought to an abrupt end. It's our right to put anyone at this time of day. We're not doing anything wrong for no one. Today I will be discussing transgressive rave culture and its commodification in society. As I believe, due to capitalism, this is one of the key features that has changed how rave has been seen today, in its perception and its transgressive acts. The idea of rave from when it first began has conceptually changed in the last 40 years, in which I believe is down to capitalism's revolving moral principles that depend on the social context at that time. Rave culture was introduced in the early 1980s, with key features including electronic dance music, underground venues, normally in secret, resulting it to become a leading outlet for gay oppressed communities at that time of the 1980s, as this was seen as a time where traditional families were encouraged. The knowledge of venues and rave was a mouth-to-mouth -mouth practice, with goers only finding out a few hours before. Where it was to be held was usually secret and it added a heightened sense of excitement, but also community. Like Sally Brass and White point out, the idea of the loud repetitive beats reverberating through the body, ensuring dancers to move in sync, touching one another. The mere use and centrality of the body at raves was transgressive in itself during the 1980s. The body coded as untamed and impure, deeming it inferior to the principles of the mind, meant rave was a threat towards society as a whole. Therefore, with this in mind, it caused a moral panic, the push for Thatcherism only enhancing fear. Homosexuality gaining such a platform, it only furthered a push for moral responsibility over hedonism, as it was a wave of threat to traditional values, and clearly the first wave of threat that we'd seen in the last 40 years. Therefore, it did not meet the needs of capitalist values at that time, as to why the body did not meet the needs of the traditional family values, Barthes furthered this point by explaining his term of jouissant, which was a term made for transforming of the body in a state of ecstasy. So the body for generations has always been seen as a prime form of social control. So it being one of the most disciplined sites in most social structures, it was deemed unacceptable due to such a loss of control in the body and mind. The issue was then amplified by not only the body being in a trance of ecstasy, but as Sally Brass mentions it, ecstasy also being the key artefact of Ray, which was also known as E. So, with the use of ecstasy by youth culture, it became seen as one of the most social drugs, or also known as the love drug, as Reynolds puts it. The increased levels of serotonin and sense of feeling in unison with music produced a collective intimacy. But, unlike alcohol, Reynolds sees it as promoting oneness of community and emptying the desire for sexual intimacy. It may be the love drug, but more agape than eros, cuddling rather than copulation. However, with capitalism's features of involvement, it comes as no shock that the inevitability of Rave's exceptions to appear. As like Foucault suggests, Part of capitalism's appeal lies in its ideological flexibility. The ability to embrace transgressive subcultures and repackage it ready to sell to controllable audiences. 
The transformation, starting on its own terms and what is deemed as acceptable at the time. The solution? It had to start with Rabe's biggest feature, spatial appropriation, which Foucault termed as heterotopias. This idea, central to Rabe, of space to be fleeting or precarious, even no space was eternal, but rather temporal. This level of spontaneity that rave culture had gave it an adrenaline edge over commercialised clubbing. The excitement for secrecy heightened an image for individuals of elite exclusivity in a different way that clubbing provided. Brewster and Broughton research into rave life found that members felt untouchable at venues were not an obstacle that prevented them in engaging with the subculture. So the growing desire of rave from youth culture, it became an opportunity to be seized for profit rather than a threat. Venues were provided and policed in the beginning of the 2000s. It then paved the way for DJ superstars to be formed by music producers due to the legality now seen in rave. It was indeed a gap in the market for nighttime economy with its growth as a popular genre. To me, it's a dance party, and that's what I tell kids. You may not have heard the word rave, but young people find out about them through a network of secret passwords. There are even rave sites on the internet. One of the reasons kids like to keep them underground and away from the prying eyes of parents and police is the widespread drug use. Raves have become a haven for drug taking with a dance beat. You cannot go to a rave. And like that news reporter suggested, the stance on MDMA and the acknowledgement of it had become known to society, with music producers using it to their own advantage. Not so subtle ways of events being named things like E Electric or E Electronica were covering anything from train stations to post lamps in all types of cities. So, with the new spaces, room for drugs, there was one element that had to change in creating a reappropriate type of rave culture that we see today. It was the music of rave itself, the unbranded, unknowing DJs that set the rave scene. Sanjek saw a rise in DJ superstars due to the change in features rave had already undergone. DJs in the 70s and 80s were not seen as artists or creators, so in order for them to be re redefined as marketable commodities, the perception had to change. They had to be unique individuals with style, talent, technical skills and personality to be branded. No longer was the DJ to be unheard. Welcome to Gordon City. And with this idea from Sanjek in mind, something that defined rave being the uninterrupted sound of music, with DJ's main jobs ensuring that the sound would not be interrupted, Sally Brass and White see the change in dynamics producing this idea of a classical statue. This transcendental individual is put on a pedestal to be admired and adored from below. Resultingly, it put a face to rave and what it was for the individuals involved. Thus, a monopoly of untouchable artists that now set the tone and style of rave today were formed. Big names like Calvin Harris, Gorgon City and Fisher have loyal fans venue hopping to see their next performance. With that, DJs have become some of the most highly paid people on the planet, which was unheard of before. This cult of DJ that Sanjek puts forward really transformed the rave scene into a commodity spectacle. Capitalism took the parts of rave to mould its form of transgression to meet its needs of the nighttime economy. Evidently shown in rave being a part of a billion pound entertainment industry, and with the commercialisation of rave, the idea of Herotopia that Falkout found in trespassing space, it was then relocated to official site of a club. To merely summarise a complex subculture like Rave to be transgressive ignores the ways that a substantial social structure adopts the symbolic activity and moulds them to serve existing social practice. An interesting thought put forward by Richberg highlighting the differences in alcohol consumption and drug use was that alcohol, bringing loads of studies of high aggression and commercial clubbing, reporting a numerous amount of sexual assault when consumed. Whereas MDMA causing a defalicizing effect, some may argue it removes these hierarchies of gender power. 
One may suggest that the pros and cons of each substance cancel the other in what each experience may entail. With this in mind, it illustrates the power that society possesses in labelling one substance deviant and the other not, based on perspective. Therefore, could it be suggested that alcohol's acceptance is due to the large profitable market that alcohol consumption provides? That may be a discussion for another day. With the main features of transgression in rave being removed and dissected, including the reappropriation of space, the use of drugs, clothing, and a change in opinion over the past 40 years, rave today may be argued to be more seen about the music people identify with, the fashion they wear, what big events are happening that year, rather than transgression being its key element. It's how individuals want to form their own identity and how they want to be seen in society. And today, rave is seen more of a music genre than a statement. It is something that people now identify with in the sense that they don't name artists, but more so the genre of music they're into. So it goes without saying that with all cultural phenomena and rave being the central topic, there is clear conflict between the symbolic and materialist aspects of rave's whole foundation. Bordeaux summarising the capitalist agenda quite nicely. The cultural businessman, like music producers, is at one and the same time the person who exploits the labour of the creator by putting it on the market. And in this case, the stage. The spectacular growth of rave will inevitably continue due to the love of music and capitalist needs to exploit to make profit. So the question is, in your eyes, does rave still inhabit the transgressive nature it once was? Thank you for listening.